dear students we are going to discuss one more image based question in general surgery this is the last module module number 9 we are going to discuss the case scenarios in trauma and uro urology case number 1 40 years old lady was brought to ane after a house fire with burns injury burns involved the anterior aspect of the whole left upper limb left half of the torso both front and back anterior thigh on the left and the circumference of whole of left leg below the knee <coughs> on examination burns wound on her left leg was found to be white hard leathery insensate and non blanching the burns wound on other areas were red blotchy wet sensate and blanching with blisters her weight was 50 kg burns affected 40% of total body surface area her burns wound on the left leg had a hard leathery feel grayish white color non blanching painless and circumferential so these are these are the pictures actually i have included six pictures and six questions so question number 1 is what are the different degrees of burns here you are seeing the different degrees of burns so the first degree involves only the epidermis with only hyperemia that's all second degree divided into superficial and deep second degree the superficial uh, second degree involves epidermis and part of the dermis with presence of blisters and it is sensate also whereas the deep second degree burns epi, uh, the whole epidermis plus the whole dermis is involved with no blisters and it is insensate the third degree skin plus the underlying soft tissue is involved in fourth degree it is involvement up to the uh, bone how you, you have to i mean uh, calculate the total body surface area burn we can assess this by three methods valles rule of 9 lundbrodo chart and palm of the patient these are the three methods the lundbrodo chart is the best method this is what you are seeing here so this is a lundbrodo chart you have to mark wherever your patient is having burns you have to mark it this is the anterior view and this is the posterior view you have to mark it on both the sides so uh, then you have to calculate the total you have to enter where whatever may be the region if it is in the head okay the posterior this is the front both both you have to mark here and then you have to total how how much is the thing but here the surface area differs depending on the age of the patient so age in uh, one month, one year old 5 years old 10 years and 15 years old and in adult patient the surface area differs that you have to take it into account okay the how will you calculate okay calculation of total iv fluids in the first 24 hours is very important so this is how you have to calculate the total body fluid requirement in the first 24 hours this formula is known as parkland formula so 4 ml of ringer's lactate into the body weight into the total body surface area burns this is the formula suppose if the patient is 65 kg with 40% burn injury then 4 ml into 65 kg into 40% that comes 10400 ml this should be i mean transfuse in the first 24 hours so half of this that is 5200 ml you have to infuse in the first 8 hours the quarter of this that is 2600 ml you have to infuse in the <coughs> next 8 hours another quarter that is another 2600 ml you have to infuse in the next 8 hours this is how you have to calculate this formula okay what is what you are seeing in figure 3 and figure 4 so in figure 3 you are seeing circumferential third degree or fourth degree burns uh, over the chest wall here whereas here you are seeing the advance i mean the third or fourth degree burns circumferentially in the upper extremity so what is the problem in this type of third and fourth degree burns which is having the which is affecting the whole circumference 
So if it is affecting the whole circumference of the chest, this HR, this, this will form an HR, this third and fourth degree, that will act as a tonic key. So patient cannot breathe properly. There won't be any chest expansion. So immediately you have to do what is called HRotomy. Here they have done what is called grid SRotomy, where you have to make horizontal and uh, vertical incision so that you, you will make a lot of grids like this so that the patient can breathe a little. Yeah, this is the thing. If it is affecting the extremities, then you have to make longitudinal incision like this. Here you are seeing incision in the forearm. Here you are seeing incision in the fingers. So this will relieve the constriction effect of the tonic key so that patient, I mean, would otherwise know if you are not going to do it, here what will happen, this, this part of the limb will, uh, I mean, it will go for gangrene because of the blood supply will be cut off. So that is the problem here. What you are seeing here in this figure, figure 5 and figure 6. So this is a, uh, a, a third or fourth degree burns. Immediately they are doing what is called tangential excision. Either manually you can do it with this Humpy's knife or you can use a, a automatic dermatome. You can remove this, I mean, burnt skin area and immediately you can take a skin graft and you can apply it over this. This is what is called tangential excision and immediate skin graft. This is split skin graft you have to put. Okay, two major factors that determines the prognosis in this patient. The total body surface area burns, inhalation injury and wound infection. These are the factors that will decide the prognosis in burns case. Case number two, three patients involved in RTA or motor vehicle accident have been brought to a &E. So this is not single patient. Three patients have been brought to the a &E. So no history of alcohol intake, but they are having altered consciousness. Following are the CT brain scan and clinical photographs. So this is what you are seeing. This is uh, the CT of three patients and these are the clinical photographs. What are Munro kelly hypothesis and Cushing's triad? These two are very important in any uh, head injury patients. So Munro kelly's hypothesis is the cerebral perfusion pressure, normally 75 to 105 millimeters of mercury equal to median arterial pressure that should be 90 to 110 millimeters of mercury minus intracranial pressure that is 5, uh, 5 to 15 millimeters of mercury. So if intracranial pressure increases in head injury, okay, what will happen? The cerebral perfusion pressure also will uh, go down. This will go down. So uh, eventually the patient will develop cerebral edema and even brain herniation. If patient is going for brain herniation, okay, that will produce the Cushing triad, where the patient will have uh, hypertension, bradycardia, and irregular uh, respiration. This will happen if the patient is developing raised intracranial pressure. So what are the findings in the CT in figure one is showing skull fractures, and the second one is showing depressed fracture, which needs surgical intervention. This is a skull fracture. Here, the first and third is showing undisplaced skull fracture, whereas the second uh, uh, CT, you are seeing depressed skull fracture, which, which needs immediately, you have to elevate this fracture. You have to do surgery, you have to elevate it, this depressed fracture. Okay, here, this picture and this picture, this CT scan, this is showing uh, lenticular or biconvex appearance. This is extradural hematoma. So apart from seeing this this one, you should also look for the midline shift in these cases. And in this CT scan, uh, you are seeing a crescentric appearance or concave con uh, convex uh, defect you are seeing here. So this is a, a subdural hematoma. Okay, here also you have to look for the midline shift. Uh, this is the uh, findings in the CT. What are the features of basilar skull fractures? Question number three. So that is what we are seeing here. If it is anterior cranial fossa fracture, you can see this is the raccoon eye and CSF rhinorrhea. This is what you are seeing here. 
raccoon's eye with csf rhinorrhea whereas if it is middle cranial fossa fracture you can see ecchymosis over the mastoid process this is called battle sign and you can also see uh, csf artoria not rhinorrhea this is artoria where hemotympanum is there and it ruptures and patient will get this csf artoria okay how will you differentiate the extradural from subdural hematoma so this is the thing you have to know sorry so the first of all where is this bleeding happen if it is extradural or uh, hematoma okay it is between the skull and the dura whereas in subdural hematoma it is between the dura and the arachnoid the involved vessel is middle meningeal artery in extradural whereas it is the injury of the bridging veins in case of subdural hematoma usually there will be lucid interval followed by unconsciousness in case of extradural hematoma whereas in subdural gradually increasing headache and confusion happens ct appearance i told you it is lenticular or biconvex appearance in extradural hematoma whereas it is crescent shaped appearance in case of subdural hematoma in uh, epidural hemorrhage this hemorrhage it won't it is limited by the suture lines whereas in subdural hemorrhage it is not limited by the suture lines so these are the things you must know and then where are all the brain herniation is happening in five areas that you have to know okay this this is the picture you should know <coughs> this is sub fall sign brain shift this is the fox cerebri sub fall sign this is the midbrain shift this is the uncus in the temporal lobe okay it is uh, herniating and it is compressing the third nerve oculomotor nerve and that is why the pupillary change is happening this is midbrain is i mean uh, uh, prolapse downwards and the tonsils the cerebellar tonsils is prolapsing or herniating through the foramen magnum all these things are herniation because of increased intracranial pressure you are seeing the uh, this is the extradural hematoma you are seeing here okay and <clears throat> how will you avoid secondary brain injury okay you have to secondary brain injury is because of the increase intracranial pressure and edema of the brain so you have to avoid hypotension yeah you have to avoid hypotension you have to avoid hypoxia you have to treat the in increase icp by elevating the head temporarily hyperventilating the patient you can also give mannitol and hypotonic saline to decrease edema and to bring down the intracranial pressure the aim is you have to avoid brain herniation and cerebral edema case number 3 a man fell off his motorcycle he felt breathless and examination revealed central cyanosis and paradoxical movement of his right chest with crepitus so every word is important so what abnormalities are seen in the x ray so with this clinical picture this x ray you are seeing multiple rib fracture not only anteriorly you are seeing rib fracture posteriorly also so this is a case of flail chest multiple rib fracture with flail segment so the paradoxical movement of the chest is highly suggestive of right flail chest okay in spontaneously breathing patient portion of the thoracic cage that has lost bony continuity retracts inward during inspiration normally it should go outwards during inspiration but it will come inwards mediastinum also will be shifted uh, to the opposite side whereas here during the expiration this this should come inwards but it is going outwards this is what is called paradoxical movement what are the injuries may occur because of the fractured rib it may injure the underlying lung okay it can produce pneumothorax hemothorax or hemonomothorax how will you manage this patient so you have to give adequate ventilation humidified oxygen and adequate analgesia unstable fractures can be managed by internal splinting so internal splinting means you have to give internal pneumatic stabilization uh, by means of intermittent pressure ventilation <coughs> intermittent positive pressure ventilation or this is one method or 
if if it is not possible this mecha mechanical ventilation then you can do open reduction and internal fixation with processes that also you can do but externally you need not apply anything to compress the flail chest case number 4 35 years old man was brought to the hospital after a road traffic accident and clinically he is breathless and hypotensive on examination air entry is diminished on the left side and left chest is hyperresonant there is mediastinal shift to the right side so this is the clinical scenario and these are the x rays but even before the x ray ordering x ray if you are having a clinical picture like this say road traffic accident patient is breathless and hypotensive air entry is diminished on left side left chest is hyperresonant and mediastinal shift to the right side immediately you have to suspect tension pneumothorax that is the that is the thing and what are the various causes for this <coughs> tension pneumothorax blunt and penetrating injury to the chest rupture of the emphysematous bulla in the lung after acute asthma attack or bare out trauma in divers that is in caisson's disease so what is the pathogenesis the ongoing air leak from lung allow continual continuous ingress of the air into pleural cavity but not egress this accumulation of air produce enormous pressure and compression the lung and mediastinal structure that is what you are seeing here see there is a leak of air from the lung so the, the air is entering into the pleural cavity but it is not escaping because of this there is enormous pressure develops here so if you percuss this area there will be hyper resonance and okay this side of diaphragm also will be depressed see here it is diaphragm here is this level whereas this diaphragm has gone down see here also depressed hemi diaphragm you can see because of the enormous pressure and mediastinal shift also these are the clinical features what is the immediate treatment you have to do immediately you have to put a white bore you have to do a white bore needle thoracostomy in the 5th intercostal space just anterior to the anterior axillary line this is the life saving procedure previously we were doing it in second intercostal space but nowadays you have to do it just anterior to the anterior axillary line in the 5th intercostal space so what is the definitive treatment after stabilizing the patient then only you have to order for the chest x ray to confirm the diagnosis and then you have to do the definitive tube thoracostomy or intercostal drain you have to put for these patients so case number 5 this man suffered fractures on the 9th 10th and 11th rib on his left rib cage due to a fall from his motorbike and this is the operative specimen and this is the ct scan what is seen in picture a picture a we are seeing a shattered spleen yeah what is the how these patients the splenic injury or splenic rupture may present they may present with hypovolemic shock due to hemoperitoneum peritonitis from extra vesicular blood and kers sign when there is hemodynamic instability evidence of persisting bleeding or other intra abdominal injuries you have to do surgery immediately the patient is hemodynamically not stable you have to do surgery only but you have to you can come uh, confirm the diagnosis by doing what is called fast scan so uh, what you will be doing this is the uh, what is seen in picture b is this is the ct scan where you are seeing the rupture of the spleen here so okay here you are seeing this is the spleen this is liver you are seeing spleen is ruptured and you are seeing the hematoma also okay based on this history we have to strongly consider the possibility of splenic injury when patient is hemodynamically stable a ct scan may be used to evaluate intra abdominal visceral injuries the ct scan shows splenic laceration with blood around it contrast leak into the abdomen suggests ongoing bleeding if unstable i told you already you have to do only fast scan and immediately you have to take the patient for exploratory laparotomy what are the complications of this uh, splenectomy so the uh, important complication is opsy that is overwhelming post splenectomy infection because these patients they will be immunocompromised easily they will get i mean infected so you have to give pneumovax in this post splenectomy patients 
within two weeks. And you have to also give lifelong oral antibiotic prophylaxis. Apart from this complication, OPSI, the post-splenectomy patient may also develop thrombocytosis. Case number 6. 45 years old man was admitted with history of sudden onset of severe left abdominal pain of 3 hours duration. Pain was radiating from left loin to his left groin and scrotum. On examination, temperature 38.5 degree Celsius. Pulse rate is 84 per minute. Respiratory rate is 20 per minute. He is pleading for pain relief. These are the two pictures and these are the five questions. What is the diagnosis? With this clinical scenario and with these two pictures. Okay, this is a uh, non-contrast single slice helical CT. So, you are seeing a stone there in the upper ureter. So, this is a case of left ureteric colic due to stone in the upper left ureter. So, figure 1 is showing, I told you, non-contrast single slice helical CT. You are seeing this apart from uh, seeing the stone. This kidney is also dilated because of hydronephrosis. Whereas the second film, this is also this is also CT scan, but this is a coronal view. This is a, a this is a, this picture you are seeing. A, this is after the uh, I mean the lithotripsy, uh, they have put a stent inside. This is what is called uh, double-ended pigtail catheter or J catheter. Yeah, this is the fragmented stone you are seeing here. And this is the uh, stent also you are seeing, double-ended pigtail catheter you are seeing here. Indication for admitting the patient. So, if there are signs of infection and if the patient is having unbearable pain, not relieved by uh, opioid analgesic, and if there are obstructive signs like hydronephrosis, then you should admit this patient. You should not treat them as outpatients. And what you will do immediate, what is the immediate treatment? You have to give... Opioid analgesics like tramadol, pethidine, morphine for pain relief and you have to give antibiotics also. What is the definitive management? Either you can do ESWL that is extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy or you can do uh, uh, urethrorhinoscope and lithotripsy using holmium laser. Both you can do. Case number 7, a 55 year old ma male Complained of left loin pain and fever. On examination, he was found to have a palpable left-sided abdominal mass. So, these are the two pictures. This is a cross-sectional CT scan, CECT, and this is a coronal view. So, what is your diagnosis? With this, he is an elderly man complained of left loin pain and a palpable left abdominal mass. So, this is most probably, this is a case of uh, renal cell carcinoma. Of course, you have to confirm the diagnosis by CACT only. This is a clear cell type, the, that uh, C, the renal cell carcinoma. And what are the risk factors? Smoking, one hippal Lindau disease and hyperlipidemia are the risk factors. What genetic factors is associated with this disease? One hippal Lindau disease. And this uh, uh, renal cell carcinoma is arising or originating from the proximal convoluted tubules. How these patients will present clinically? Patient can present as unexplained anemia, weight loss, renal mass, hematuria, or in elderly male patient, uh, it can present as sudden appearance of varicocele. Especially if the patient is having a left-sided tumor, then if they are suddenly, if they, uh, uh, they may develop a varicocele. CECT, apart from looking the degree of invasion of the kidney, whether it has gone, whether the, uh, I mean, the malignancy is only inside the kidney or it has gone outside, that you have to look. Also, you have to look for involvement of the renal vein and IVC, IVC invasion. And also look for lymph node invasion. And how will you manage this question? If it is a localized renal cell carcinoma, you have to do radical nephroureterectomy. Or you can do nephron sparing nephrectomy or partial nephrectomy, especially if the patient is having solitary kidney or tumor size is less than 4 cm. If it is locally advanced renal cell carcinoma, you can 
do radical nephroureterectomy plus removal of the thrombus from the renal vein and the IVC. If it is advanced metastatic renal cell carcinoma, you can do cytoreductive nephrectomy, not radical one. And apart from that, you can give immunotherapy in form of LAK, that is lymphokine activated killer cells you can, you can give. And you can also give targeted chemotherapy in form of sumitinib and sorafenib. Case number 8. 60 year old man complained of painless hematuria. A flexible cystoscopy was performed and you are seeing the picture here. This is the cystoscopic picture. This is the histology. And this is an another patient where this is a post, uh, the, this is the specimen. After removing the specimen, they are showing us what is your diagnosis. So here you are seeing the finding. This is a case of bladder carcinoma. Uh, it is a non-muscle invasive type. What are the risk factors? Smoking is a risk factor. Another one is those aniline dye workers, those who are working in aniline dye factories. And <coughs> what is the treatment you will do in this case? Because it is a non-muscle invasive cancer, we can do TURBT, that is transurethral resection of bladder tumor, followed by topical chemotherapy. Prognosis depends on whether it is non-muscle invasive or muscle invasive. Even in muscle invasive, you have to look for the staging of the disease, whether it has gone, I mean, outside the bladder and invading the nearby organ, that also you have to take it into consideration. Figure 4 is showing, this is the, I told you, this is the specimen after removing, for this is not this patient, another patient where it is an invasive type of bladder carcinoma, where they have done a radical total cystoprostatectomy. See, prostate also they have removed. Only thing is, after doing this surgery, you have to do a ileal conduit for drainage of the urine. So, both the ureters, you have to implant in the ileal segment and you have to uh, do this ileal conduit for the urinary diversion. Case number 9, this is a 5 months old boy has been brought to the hospital for complaints of difficulty in passing urine with ballooning of prepuce. Clinical picture is shown here. Okay, this is the operative picture. And what is the diagnosis? Here in this picture, clearly you are seeing a condition called BXO. That is, this is phimosis due to, BXO means Balanitis Gerotica obliterans. So what are the indications for circumcision? Commonly, it is performed for religious reason. The otherwise, the real phimosis happens in balanitis, gerotica obliterans, those who are having pastitis and balanopastitis. <laughs> pastitis means inflammation of the prepuce. Balanopastitis is inflammation of both prepuce and glans penis or those who are having paraphimosis. These are the indications for circumcision. How will you do the classical circumcision? Classically, you have to remove the excessive skin and suture the skin with the incised mucosa after putting the frenular stitch. And don't use monopolar diatomy or local anesthetic with adrenaline, which will result in gangrene. So this is the classical uh, circumcision where you have to make a skin incision, excise the excessive skin, you have to put a frenular stitch also. This is the classical method. What are the other ways of doing circumcision in infants. So, this is the Gomco clamp and Mogan clamp and plastible technique. Plastible technique, okay, you can do for neonates, but these two procedures are not very famous, Gomco and Mogan clamp, where because, no, if you are not very careful, you are like to, likely to injure the glans penis. So, but I have not done both Gomco and Mogan's. I have done plenty of this classical circumcision and uh, Plastibel also I have done for neonates. So these two methods are not famous. What are the complications? Hemorrhage can happen, infection and sometimes injury to the glans penis. Case number 10, one month old boy presented with right scrotal pain for the past four hours. He had vomiting twice, no history of trauma. On examination, skin overlying the right scrotum was <coughs> erythematous and edematous. Right testicle is exclusively tender and cremastic reflex absent on the right side. So, with these clinical pictures, 
you are seeing almost six pictures and six costumes what is your diagnosis this this with this clinical picture with this clinical photographs diagnosis is okay the tarsen test is of left testis tarsen test is what are the differential diagnosis tarsen test is tarsen of testicular appendages and acute epididyma of gyttis these are the differential diagnosis what you are seeing in figure 1 2 and 3 so here you are seeing a left hemiscrotum is edematous and hyperemic in the second picture after exploration you are seeing the testis is already it is Uh, gangrenous and necrotic you cannot save this testis you have to do only arcticectomy whereas in this picture another patient after detarsing the testis the color become normal so here you can salvage the testis you have to do what is called fixation arcopexy that is what you have to do and what is this uh, uh, picture this is a investigation uh, this is a gold standard investigation known as duplex scan where you are seeing absence of blood supply to the body of the testis whereas blood supply is there in the periphery of the testis this is very classical of uh, i mean the um, tarsen testis yeah here these two pictures you are seeing the testicular appendages here it is not testicular epididymal appendages twisted so here you are seeing the um, blue dot sign how will you differentiate this Uh, testicular appendages tarsen from the tarsen testis in tarsen testis cremastic reflex will be option whereas in epididymal or testicular appendages tarsen the cremastic reflex will be intact apart from that here you can see a blue dot sign which is absent in case of tarsen testis this is how you have to differentiate these two from the real tarsen testis okay how will you manage this patient surgical exploration should be done within 6 hours of onset of symptom to solve the cystis suppose if uh, patients are bringing the baby at 1 uh, o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning and you are unable to do the uh, duplex scan then you have to explain the problem to the parents and you have to explore don't wait until the next day because you cannot wait more than 6 hours so same site you have to explore and if the testis is viable do arcticectomy if the testis is non viable sorry if the testis is non viable do arcticectomy if the testis is viable you have to do what is called fixation arcopexy in contralateral side also you have to explore because the belklafer deformity is uh, very common in these problems i mean the tarsen testis so you explore them contralateral normal side also and do what is called prophylactic fixation arcopexy with non absorbable suture material you have to take the suture in uh, tunica albigenia to the uh, dotage muscle case number 11 a child is born with the following congenital anomaly so you are seeing some pictures here so what are the two lesions you are seeing in this picture so what are those lesions you are seeing both cleft lip and cleft palate how often okay what is the incidence of these two lesion 45% both the lesions can happen together 45% have both the anomalies 15% they'll have only cleft lip 40% they have only cleft palate what is the embryological basis of cleft lip and cleft palate cleft lip the different degree of failure of fusion of frontonasal process with maxillary process that is the uh, problem whereas in cleft palate there is failure of fusion of palatine process of the maxilla with the pre maxilla that is the part which bursts the four incisor teeth what is the immediate problem in cleft palate uh, babies the immediate problem with cleft palate is feeding the baby because the baby cannot have Uh, the suckling or the sucking mechanism and breast feeding is not feasible to avoid the nasal regurgitation in these cleft palate babies you can use palatine obturator which you can get it from the dental surgeon or you can use long nipple in the feeding bottles or you can do frequent sp spoon feeding of express breast milk so how will you manage these babies so this is the thing you must know so it depends on 
whether it is only cleft lip alone or cleft palate alone or both together if it is cleft lip alone and unilateral then you have to do only one operation at 5 to 6 months of age if it is cleft lip alone and bilateral here also you have to do one surgery only but in 4 to 5 months you can do it if it is cleft palate alone and it is involving only the soft palate only one surgery at 6 months of age if it is only cleft palate involving both the soft and hard palate you have to do two surgeries soft palate at 6 months of age hard palate at 15 to 18 months of age if it is both cleft lip and palate there is no role of single surgery always you have to do two surgeries if it is unilateral the cleft lip and soft palate can be operated at 5 to 6 months the hard palate you can operate at 15 to 18 months of age in bilateral also you have to do two surgeries cleft lip and soft palate at 4 to 5 months instead of 5 to 6 months here if it is bilateral 4 to 5 months and hard palate you can do at 15 to 18 months case number 12 35 year old male patient presented with painless progressively increasing right sided scrotal swelling for the past 2 years on examination there was 10 into 15 cm size scrotal swelling palpable in the right scrotum which was not tender but fluctuant transluminant not reducible with no cough impulse get out of the swelling was positive so these are the various pictures and these are the seven questions so what is your diagnosis and why you are saying so so clearly these clinical pictures you can see swelling in the hemiscrotum here on the right side here also they are doing the fluctuation test so diagnosis is quite obvious this is a case of uh, vaginal hydrocele why it is vaginal hydrocele because it is a scrotal swelling which was painless and this was progressively increasing one it was not tender but fluctuation and transluminant both were positive it was not reducible with there was no cough impulse also and get above the swelling was also positive so what other history you have to ask in this patients what are the other questions you will ask in the history so that is also you have to know you have to ask the history of trauma or fever with or without chills so then the various pictures <coughs> what clinical tests are being performed in figure 1 2 3 and 4 see it is quite obvious in figure number 1 they are doing the transelimination test which is brilliantly positive in case of vaginal hydrocele that is what you are seeing here in this picture but the only precaution you have to do while you are eliciting the transelimination in the scrotum is you have to place the touch light either anteriorly medially or laterally you can place but you should not place this light in the posterior aspect of the scrotum because the testis will come in between and that will, that won't allow the light to pass through it <coughs> so the patient will have false negative <coughs> and that is why uh, that precaution you should know and the second this test is get above the swelling this is this particular test is to differentiate a pure scrotal swelling from the inguinal scrotal swelling so if it is a pure scrotal swelling like hydrocele you should be able to feel the upper border of the swelling and in a male patient you should be able to feel the spermatic cord here suppose if it is a inguinal scrotal swelling you cannot palpate the upper border of the swelling you cannot also palpate 
the spermatic cord instead along with the spermatic cord the the uh, hernial sac also will be there so uh, you can, you may not be able to feel the upper border of the scully this picture they are demonstrating the fluctuation test see two fingers are kept here and two fingers here if you press these two fingers the fluid will be shifted and you can feel that pressure in the other two fingers there and this is the fluctuation test all uh, i mean cystic swellings are swellings with fluid inside you should elicit this fluctuation test and this figure 4 they are doing what is called traction test they are just pulling the testis down in case of encysted hydrocel we used to do this test because while you are pulling the testis downwards the encysted hydrocel also will come down what are the seven types of hydrocel so you can see this picture and you can answer this is a case of congenital hydrocel this is a case of funicular hydrocel where the hydrocel sac is stopping just above the testis and this is a case of infantile hydrocel where the upper limit of the swelling is extending into the external ring into the inguinal canal up to the internal ring so in this case that that is the infantile hydrocel the uh, get above the swelling is not possible because you cannot feel the upper limit because it is going into the up to the internal ring and this is a case of encysted hydrocel where you can elicit this test the traction test if you are going to pull this testis downwards along with the testis this part of the swelling also will come down that is the traction test and this is the commonest variety of hydrocel the vaginal hydrocel where the pattern processes usually get obliterated if this pattern the the process is vaginalis is pattern then that is the congenital variety of hydrocele and this is a special variety of hydrocele known as bilocular hydrocele so there will be a cystic swelling in the scrotum and another cystic swelling in the anterior abdominal wall both are interconnected so you will you will be able to demonstrate what is called cross fluctuation if you press this swelling in the scrotum you can feel it in the swelling in the cystic swelling in the anterior abdominal wall and this this is a <coughs> hernia of the hydrocel sac this is a hydrocel but the momentum is coming and blocking the internal ring so this is hernia of the hydrocel sac okay what surgeries are being done in figure 7 and figure 8 <coughs> if we are dealing with very big hydrocele we have to do <coughs> what is called jebulous operation that is nothing but incision and eversion of the sac you have to incise it you have to evacuate the fluid you can see the fluid is coming out like a fountain this is a straw colored fluid which is transparent to the light that is why this uh, hydrocel is brilliantly transluminescent so after evacuating the fluid you had to extend the incision and then you had to evert you had to bring this sac posterior to the testis and then you had to suture it this is for big hydrocel suppose if the hydrocel is a small one then we can do this surgery this is called large splication where after incising this uh, tunica vaginalis and evacuating the fluid you can you you can now uh, you can bring the testis forward like this this is the tunica vaginalis you can take multiple bites or rows of sutures and one by one you have to tie all these things so that the tunica vaginalis will form a cuff 
around the testis <coughs> and this surgery is called large splication surgery what are the post op complication secondary hemorrhage will result in hematoma infection will result in pyocele it may result in sinus formation or sometimes recurrent hydrocele is also a complication case number 13 a 22 years old male patient presented with a painless swelling in his right scrotum for the past 3 weeks the swelling was not increasing in size there was no history of trauma fever or burning micturition on examination there was 5 into 4 cm size hard painless mass in his right testis you can see it here para aortic lymph nodes are palpable this is in this picture and virtuous nodes are also palpable virtuous node is also it, it was also palpable you can yeah see in this picture so these are the six pictures and these are the seven questions so question number 1 what is your diagnosis and why you are saying so this is a case of carcinoma of the uh, uh, testicular carcinoma right sided testicular carcinoma because patient is a only a relatively young patient 22 years old with painless hard mass in his right hemiscrotum with para aortic lymph nodes and virtuous nodes both are palpable so what are the risk factors for this patient or for any patient to develop carcinoma of the testis men with cryptorchidism that is the undescended testis especially those who are in having intra abdominal testis are having highest risk testicular cancer in the contra lateral testis already they had testicular cancer in the opposite side they are more risky to develop cancer in the other side family history of testicular cancer and those who are having clean felter syndrome so these are the uh, risk factors for the patient to develop carcinoma of the testis so what are the clinical features of this uh, carcinoma of the testis patient <coughs> they had they, they have painless enlargement of the testicles firmness of the testicle will be there sometimes there may be lax secondary hydrocele back or abdominal pain secondary to retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy that is inter aorto caval lymphadenopathy history of weight loss with left supraclavicular lymphadenopathy that is the virtuous nodes are were or palpable enlarged retroperitoneal lymph node or lymphadenopathy is very common hepatomegaly also common dyspnea is secondary to pulmonary mets gynecomastia is secondary to hormonal secretions so what are the classification of this testicular tumor this is the who classification so we can classify the tumor as germ cell tumors which consists of 90% of the cases and the six card or gonadal stromal tumors that is another 10% or 8% another 2% is miscellaneous non specific stromal tumors so under germ cell tumors majority of them almost more than 48% are seminomas non seminomatous germ cell tumors consists of 42% under this non seminomatous germ cell tumor there are four types teratoma which is the most common type embryonal carcinoma yolk sac tumor chorio carcinoma and there is mixed non seminomatous 
germ-cell tumor and mixed germ-cell tumors are also there. The sex card or gonadal stromal tumors are Leydig cell tumor and Sertoli cell tumor and the mixed variety also. Coming to the miscellaneous non-specific stromal tumors, ovarian epithelial tumors, tumors of the collecting ducts and retreated testis, lymphoma, leukemia, but this is very, very negligible percentage. Okay. What is the staging system of this testicular tumor? Stage 1 is tumor is confined to the testis. Okay. It is denoted by the red color here. Stage 2, retroperitoneal lymph node involvement and in stage 2A, nodes, the nodes are less than 2 cm size. In 2B, the nodes are in between 2 to 5 cm size. In 2C, the nodes are more than 5 cm size. But all these nodes are infradiaphragmatic, which is denoted by the green color here. All green color nodes are stage 2. Stage 3, metastasis above the diaphragm but confined only to the lymph nodes. This is denoted by the orange color here. So it is, it is confined only to the supradiaphragmatic lymph node involvement. Yeah, that is stage 3. Stage 4, extra lymphatic metastasis usually to the lungs and liver. So here you can see it. This is denoted by the blue color. You can see it. Blue color here. Blue color here. So this is the stage 4. Uh, stage 4 uh, uh, disease. Okay. That is the R with all distant metastasis also comes in this group. So what is the uh, important investigations you can do so that you can come to a diagnosis? Usually, in all tumors, we should do a biopsy, but here, <coughs> transcrotal biopsy is contraindicated. Transcrotal biopsy is contraindicated because uh, it will produce what is called seeding. So, the gold standard investigation is scrotal duplex scan. That we, you can do to confirm the diagnosis. And then, after removing the testis, you have to again send it for biopsy. And what is the treatment for carcinoma of the testis? Suppose if it is yearly seminoma, you can do orchidectomy and retroperitoneal uh, X-ray therapy or the deep X-ray therapy. If it is advanced seminoma, you can do orchidectomy and combination chemotherapy followed by restaging because seminomas are highly radiosensitive. You can use the retroperitoneal X-ray therapy in case of early seminoma. Suppose if it is stage 1 non-seminoma, then we can do orchidectomy plus retroperitoneal lymph node dissection or we can do just surveillance, follow-up only. Because here, the non-seminomas are not radiosensitive. The stage 2 non-seminoma, the optimal management of this group of patients is controversial. The retroperitoneal lymph node dissection can be curative, but have a very high relapse rate. If relapse occurs, then chemotherapy can be given as adjunctive therapy. Alternatively, chemotherapy can be given prior to retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. Advanced stage non-seminoma, we can do orchidectomy plus chemotherapy plus or minus tumor reductive surgery or cytoreduction of the tumor. Number seven, the most commonly used chemotherapeutic regimen is etoposide, bleomycin, and cisplastin. The prognosis of seminomas is excellent due to its high sensitivity 
to radiation. Another one question they commonly ask is what is chi vasu maneuver in case of uh, carcinoma of the testes. Suppose you are not very sure about whether the testicular tumor is malignant or not. While you are doing high orchidectomy, you have to occlude the spermatic cord with non-occlusive vascular clamp, take inside the uh, tunica albuginea, take a small piece of testicular tissue and send it for frozen section biopsy. The pathologist should be able to tell whether the tumor is malignant one or benign one within 10 minutes time. So if it is malignant, okay, go ahead and do high orchidectomy. If it is a benign tumor, okay, you need not do high orchidectomy. You just remove that vascular clamp and place the testis back into the scrotum. That is what you had to do. Case number 14. A 64-year-old painter present with reduced urinary stream and incomplete emptying of the bladder with nocturia of two to three times at night. He is a smoker and has ischemic heart disease. So these are the various pictures and these are the seven questions. So what is the likely differential diagnosis? in this patient. So this is obviously this is a bladder outlet obstruction. So what are the different causes for bladder outlet obstruction? This broadly we can divide it into structural causes and functional causes. The structural causes for bladder outlet obstruction are urethral valves, that is the posterior urethral valve which is very common in children. Urethral strictures, benign prostatic hyperplasia <coughs> and carcinoma of the prostate, both are common in elderly male patients. And bladder neck stenosis. The functional causes are bladder neck dyssynergia. That is the incoordination between the detrusor muscle and the sphincter or the bladder outlet or the neurological disease that is the neurological bladder, neurogenic bladder or some of the drugs can also cause the bladder outlet obstruction. So what are the various symptoms in bladder outlet obstruction or in a case of benign prostatic hyperplasia. So these symptoms we can broadly divide into obstructive symptom and storage or irritative symptoms. The obstructive symptoms are hesitancy, dribbling of urine, poor flow of urine, sensation of incomplete bladder emptying. The storage or irritative symptoms are frequency, urgency, urgent or urge incontinence and enuresis. <coughs> what are the other things you will ask in the history apart from these regular symptoms? So etiology, you can ask previous endoscopic procedures or any urinary infections, stone disease, family history of prostate cancer. This history you can ask the patients. General fitness and quality of life. Regarding that, you can ask for comorbidity with ischemic heart disease, hypertension and diabetes. There, there, there are scoring systems exist that would quantify the lower urinary tract dysfunction and the effect on the quality of life. <coughs> that is... The scoring system is International Prostate Symptom Score or IPSS. It also includes bothersomeness, whether it is 
affecting the patient quality of life. This is important to determine what type of treatment to give. How will you assess the uh, International Prostate Symptom Score? So IPSS is used to grade symptom severity to choose the optimal treatment. The mnemonic for that is fun voice. It can be used to remember the seven questions relating to symptoms of BPH. Or this is also known as this IPSS is also known as American Urological Association 7 grading system. The severity for each symptom we usually give a grading from 1 to 5. So, 7 uh, things we are going to ask. Each we are giving 1 to 5 marks. So, maximum mark is 35. The fun wise is the mnemonic. You have to ask F for frequency, U for urgency, N for nocturia, W for weak stream, I for intermittency, S for straining, and E for sensation of incomplete emptying. So if the score is between 0 to 7, that means it's a mild BPH. If the score is 8 to 19, that means it is a moderate enlargement of prostate gland. If the score is between 20 to 35, then it is a severe BPH or severe enlargement of the prostate gland. So what other, uh, I mean, what clinical examination you will do in a case of uh, benign prostate hyperplasia? The examination of abdomen for a palpable bladder or any other masses. Any other mass means you can feel the hydronephrotic kidney also, apart from the palpable bladder. You should also do a digital uh, rectal examination to assess the size and consistency of the prostate. Prostate tenderness means it is prostatitis. Usually, if it is carcinoma of the prostate, the uh, consistency will be very hard, and we can feel nodules in the prostate. It may be a single nodule, or sometimes the whole prostate may be replaced with uh, all nodular prostate, it's called. So that is what is called um, <coughs> Craigy prostate. What are the investigations you will do in a case of BPH? We should do urine to rule out hematuria and you should do cytology to rule out any malignant tumor. Blood urea, creatinine and PSA should be done. PSA more than 4 nanogram. Usually it may be a benign swelling between 4 to 10 but if it is more than 20 to 30 nanogram, <coughs> more chances of <coughs> malignancy. Abdominal ultrasound with post-voidal residual urine measurement must be done. If the post-voidal residual urine volume is more than 100 ml, that is a definite indication for surgical intervention. We should also do what is called transrectal ultrasound, which will reveal hypoechoic mass. And if you are seeing any mass in the, uh, in the prostate, you should also take biopsy using this uh, transrectal ultrasound guidance. We have to take biopsy from six areas, three from each lobe to rule out carcinoma. Pressure flow Eurodynamic study should also be done. Urinary flow rates usually decrease <coughs> for a wider volume of more than 200 ml. A peak flow rate of more than 15 ml per second is normal. 
if it is 10 to 15 ml per second, that is equivocal. If it is less than 10 ml per second, that is low flow. This is regarding the urinary flow rate. Regarding the voiding pressure, usually that increase. Pressures more than 80 cm of water are high. Pressures between 60 to 80 cm of water or equivocal. Pressures between less than 60 cm of water, this is normal. <clears throat> so what is the treatment? How will you manage a case of BPH? Watchful waiting or medical treatment for those who are having less than 100 ml of postvital residual urine in bladder by doing an ultra abdominal ultrasound. So you can give medical treatment by giving alpha blockers like tamsulosin and 5-alpha reductase blockers like finasteride. Minimally invasive surgery if the uh, postvital residual urine is more than 100 ml, then we can do minimally invasive surgeries like transurethral resection of prostate or so many other types of minimally invasive or endourological procedures are there. Tuna, tumat, tulip, tuip, so many types are there. <coughs> or previously, we were doing open surgery, either transvesicle or retropubic prostatectomies. We used to do in the past, but nowadays these surgeries are not in vogue. Case number 15. 80 years old Chinese man complained of severe back pain and progressively poor urinary stream and urinary frequency. His serum PS PSA was no more than 30 nanograms per ml. So these are the four pictures and these are the seven questions. The first picture you are seeing an transrectal ultrasound and this is a x-ray of the pelvis and the lower vertebra and this is the transrectal ultrasound is done here and this is the biopsy they are doing under the transrectal uh, ultrasound okay you have to take the biopsy three from each lobe three from right side and three from from the peripheral uh, lobe we have to take biopsy. Okay. What abnormality can you observe in this X-ray and in this um, uh, ultrasound, transrectal ultrasound? Transrectal ultrasound, in the periphery, you are seeing, yeah, you are seeing this one. Hypoechoic shadow. This is suspicious. If you are seeing any hypoechoic shadow here, that is suspicious of uh, carcinoma in the prostate. Here you are seeing osteosclerotic bony deposit in pelvic bone due to secondaries from CA prostate. So what is the diagnosis? This is stage 4 metastatic prostatic <coughs> carcinoma. So number uh, 3 question is what is PSA. What is PSA? It is prostatic acid phosphatase and it is produced by the normal and malignant prostatic ductal and acinar epithelial cells. <coughs> it acts as a tumor marker. However, diagnosis should be confirmed by transrectal <coughs> Ultrasound guided biopsy, six, six biopsies from peripheral lobes, three on each side. In what other condition the PSA will be elevated apart from CA prostate? Even in benign prostate hyperplasia, prostatitis, post urinary retention, <coughs> post digital rectal examination, and urinary catheterization. In all these things, 
okay the psa will be elevated but if it is abnormally elevated then only you have to suspect uh, malignancy but always malignancy should be confirmed by biopsy only so if it is already a metastatic carcinoma how will you manage we have to do hormonal manipulation only that is deprivation of androgen or the testosterone <coughs> androgen blockade with estrogen like diethyl stilbosterol or nowadays we are doing anti androgen like flutamide or lh or h uh, agonist like gosrelin or surgical castration that is subcapsular orchidectomy and radiotherapy this is the treatment and question number 6 what is this gleason scoring so gleason scoring yeah I, i'll show you gleason scoring c it is grade 1 2 1 2 3 4 and 5 3 grades you can see this is a histological grading so it is in grade 1 small and uniform glands you can see in grade 2 okay this is also known as well differentiated in grade 2 more stromal spaces between the glands you can see the in between spaces you can see okay and then in grade 3 distinctly infiltration of the cells from glands at margins infiltration of cells are there in grade 4 irregular masses of neoplastic cells with very few glands here so now it is moderately differentiated in grade 3 grade 4 it becomes poorly grade 4 and grade 5 poorly differentiated and known as also known as anaplastic but nowadays this is the traditional gleason score this is the five things where we say gleason if it is grade 1 gleason 3 plus 3 6 only individual discrete well formed glands <coughs> grade 2 but nowadays we are not giving this 3 plus 3 6 3 plus 4 7 4 plus 3 7 like that we are this is the new grading system that is grade just we are saying grade 1 to grade 5 that's all we are not giving the score nowadays and what is the treatment for this particular case or any carcinoma of the prostate so what is the treatment if it is localized disease this is this patient is already metastatic disease but suppose if it is a localized disease that means it is stage 1 or the tumor is confined to testis only then if we can do what is called watchful waiting radical prostatectomy radiotherapy and brachytherapy is the treatment of choice if it is locally advanced disease then also we can do radical prostatectomy adjuvant radiotherapy androgen deprivation like flutamide can be given if it is a metastatic disease then we can do subcapsular orchidectomy to deprive androgen anti androgen like flutamide lhrh and uh, rh inhibitor like gosrelin can be given or we can decrease the androgen by giving ketoconazole these are the different ways we can treat a case of ca prostate but the prognosis is very dismal <coughs>